everyone and welcome to this third uh, Inclusive Green Finance Working Group technical webinar. Uh, today uh, we'll be talking about increasing the resilience against climate change and disaster risks and the role of the supervisors. So diving more into the third pillar, the, 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 four, the third P, uh, the third pillar of IGF protection. So with this, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to give over to the chair of the IGF Working Group, uh, Valid Ali from the Central Bank of Egypt. Thank you, Johanna. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here uh, again for the third webinar. I would like to thank everybody who uh, is attending with us today. It's a pleasure to, to be with you. I would like to thank all the participants and all the speakers of today for uh, such an important uh, topic. Uh, looking forward. Back to you, Johanna. Thank you uh, very much, Valid. Um, so today uh, we have the great pleasure of welcoming two technical experts uh, with us for this uh, webinar around protection policies and more specifically uh, climate risk insurance. So let me introduce to you Teresa Pelada from the Access to Insurance Initiative, where she's been working since 2014. She is the lead contact for Central and Eastern Europe and the Caribbean region, responsible for A2II's implementation activities and cooperation with supervisors and regional associations. She is furthermore the A2II monitoring and evaluation specialist and responsible for the topic of climate change and disaster risk resilience. And in 2016, she was seconded to the Insurance Supervisory Authority of Peru, CBS, where she supported the modification of the current microinsurance regulation. It's also a great pleasure introducing to you Kofi Ando from the National Insurance Commission in Ghana, NIC. Uh, Kofi Ando has worked in NIC since the year 2000, and he was the head of supervision from January 2006 to September 2017. He is currently the Deputy Commissioner of Insurance. And prior to joining NIC, he worked for three years in KPMG. So the both of you, a very big thank you for joining us to this webinar and for sharing your expertise and knowledge on this very interesting topic. Um, just so you know, we have a specific subgroup in the working group who's working on this, these questions. So it's an extra interest for them. Um, but uh, with this, thank you so much for being here. And I give over to Teresa, who will start the presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Johanna. Just a quick test, can you all hear me well? Can you see me all fine? Yeah? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes. yes okay, can. excellent. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you very much for the introduction, Johanna, and thanks for the opportunity to present A5's work on climate risk insurance here today. I was actually very much looking forward to uh, seeing you all in person in Accra, but I'm glad we can at least connect here virtually. So before I start with my presentation, just a few words on the Access to Insurance Initiative for those of you not familiar with this um, uh, initiative. So we were founded in 2009 as a global initiative. We are the implementation partner of the IAIS, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors on Inclusive Insurance and Capacity Building. And I'm on the next slide. Um, it is our mission to uh, enhance the capacity and understanding of insurance supervisors on inclusive insurance topics. And we do, so, do so through organizing trainings, events, and we do research and just generally knowledge generation. And in 2019, we decided to put a special focus on climate and disaster, on the topic of climate and disaster risk insurance and to do some further research, especially to really better understand what is exactly the role of insurance providers in enhancing resilience. So this brings me to my next slide with the agenda for today. I would like to briefly talk about the challenges we are facing in light of climate change and then see how insurance can help mitigate at least some of these risks. And after that, talk a little bit about the role that insurance providers play in enhancing resilience. So next slide. 
But let me start uh, with a quote from an uh, economist from Swiftly. I just found that in the recently published IGMA uh, report that says that we cannot quantify the exact effect climate change has on weather-related catastrophe, but it is clear that climate change is, climate change is a systemic risk to the global macroeconomy. And it's true we cannot quantify exactly the impact of climate change, but what we see is that um, the severity and frequency of natural catastrophes is definitely increasing. And around the world, these manifest in very different way, ways. So we have in some regions um, torrential rains, we have flooding. In other regions, we face droughts and wildfires and other extreme weather events. This brings me to my next slide. And um, I also too wanted to bring in this new aspect here. So when looking at the press of these days, um, it also shows that climate change does not only affect the intensity of natural catastrophes, but it is also considered to be uh, a driving force for pandemics like the current situation uh, we are facing, the COVID-19, but also Ebola and other um, pandemics. And the number of researchers today think that this is actually um, humanity's destruction of biodiversity that creates the condition for new viruses and diseases such as COVID-19. So I don't want to go into detail here on that topic. I just wanted to highlight the um, what is just to just highlight um, that this is also a topic we will be um, faced with in future. And I just wanted to leave these two um, press uh, or the headings of two press articles I found these um, days. Okay, is the sound better now? I just got the message. I should come closer to my microphone. I hope it's working better now. Um, Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, what we see is that also these catastrophes, um, be it extreme weather events or um, pandemic, they affect us globally. So all regions, countries are affected. But what we see is that um, the impact is different and it is um, mostly those suffering the most are the, the most vulnerable ones. So we are all affected, but the impact is different. And it's actually not only the economic and the immediate impact that affects people, but it's also these effects that persist over time. So we have case studies from floodings in Indian cities that show that without any social protection, disaster hit families deplete their savings or they borrow at high interest rates from informal sources, and this can push them into poverty traps. And also just thinking about these disaster hit families and the fact that they reduce household spendings on food and medicine, education, this can really stand the child's potential well into adulthood. So these are the um, um, effects that we can see. And this brings me already to the next topic on the, um, on the agenda. Next slide, please. So being aware of all these um, challenges, so what, is, um, what can we do to make people, especially the most vulnerable ones, more resilient to catastrophes that are becoming, or many of them becoming more severe due to climate change? Next slide, please. So one important tool to build resilience is the access to climate risk insurance. insurance. But um, I just wanted to highlight here with this slide that uh, risk transfers or insurance is only one piece of a broader risk management strategy. So we need a comprehensive climate risk management system spanning really a continuum of prevention, risk reduction, risk retention, and risk transfer, such as, for example, insurance schemes. So insurance is only one part of it and it is also not the silver bullet. It may be the most appropriate tool for large uh, risk of low frequency that cannot be reduced or managed otherwise. But in the case of frequent and less intense risk, the um, most effective responses could be investment in improved disaster resilient infrastructure, education, or um, prevention measures like early warning systems. So this is really just to highlight that we need a couple of, of, of tools and we need a, a broad risk management strategy where, in, where insurance is one uh, piece of the puzzle. Next slide, please.
Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to highlight that is only one financial instrument. So insurance is only one instrument. It is crucial for people to have access to a variety of financial instruments. So as you can see here on the slide, also the access to savings, credits, remittances, and so on is, um, is crucial for people. So um, what we need is really, as I said, the set of financial instruments and how in order to help people to prepare. So for example, people also need savings to be able to draw on after a shock occurs and so on. So this is um, just to, yeah, to show you that, that this not, it's not only insurance. Next slide, please. But since I work for the Access to Insurance Initiative, let me come back uh, to insurance, uh, which is the topic of this presentation today. And when I talk about climate risk insurance, what I mean is any insurance solution that aims to provide coverage against climate risks. And climate risks are natural disasters that affect everyone, but uh, especially the vulnerable households, smallholder farmers. And when I talk about climate risks, risks, some of these risks are amplified by climate change, others not, so I will not make a distinction here. It's just climate risks. But I want to um, give some uh, one clarification. So traditionally, when we talk about insurance, insurance claims are based on an assessment of the actual damage to the insured asset. So just to give you an example, when a hurricane hits your property and the property is destroyed or partly destroyed, someone from the insurance company would come to your, to your house and assess your loss and then you get paid according to the actual damage. But when we talk about climate risk insurance, we mostly talk about index-based insurance. And index-based insurance is a little bit different. So that means um, when a weather parameter reaches a predefined threshold, an index triggers the payout according to a predefined payout rate. Right? So this means that the value does not necessarily match the insured actual losses. So that's the biggest inference, uh, difference to, let's say, uh, traditional insurance. Next slide, please. There are um, many different approaches to climate risk insurance, also in different levels. So insurance can protect directly or indirectly vulnerable, seg vulnerable segments of the population. And the level here depends on who has the insurable interest. So it's not who is paying, but who is protected. And we see here in this um, graph that we have macro level solutions, which aim to protect directly the budget of national or local governments, and to, uh, they reduce the burden after a disaster. So here the government is the policy holder and the beneficiary of the insurance policy. So this is, um, for example, the case for, for these sovereign uh, insurance schemes like the African risk capacity. Then on the MESO level, we have solutions that aim to directly protect organizations that provide key services to vulnerable communities, households, farmers, such as, for example, MF MFIs, cooperatives. So they are the ones providing the services to the low-income people, and they get protected through these uh, insurance solutions. And then, of course, we have on the micro level many examples of um, climate risk insurance that protects um, in individually directly. So we have great examples here like the World Food uh, Program, the R4 program, which um, what I just mentioned does not only offer insurance but a set of tools so that people can um, better prepare for a natural catastrophe. catastrophe. Next slide please. So as we see, I mean Insurance and climate risk insurance can be um, a very important tool, but as you see on this slide is that there is a huge protection gap. And protection gap means that the economic losses and that there is a gap between the uh, economic losses and insured losses from disasters. So this gap is extremely high when you look at this map in emerging countries. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, uh, for, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the, this gap is almost 100%, so most of natural catastrophes are not covered at all by insurance. And this is something which has not changed over 
for the years and also it's um, true that this gap is even widening through to climate change. Next slide please. So what are the causes of the protection gap? There are several reasons for the protection gap. And what I just wanted to quickly show with this um, graph from the Geneva Association is that you can find these, um, these reasons for the protection gap on both on the supply and on the demand side. And they also differ depending on the sophistication of the market. So when we look at the merchant market, here at the supply side, one of the major barriers is um, what it's called here institutions, and this include, includes the regulatory frameworks. So regulatory frameworks can unintentionally hinder the development of sustainable insurance market by creating, for example, unnecessary barriers like restriction on products or distribution channels or so on. So as you see, there are many other um, barriers, but let me focus on the one of uh, regulation and come, let's come to the next slide. Um, so this is also very much uh, in line with what we found out in the survey that we conducted in 2019 when we asked um, insurers whether they were facing any regulatory barriers when implementing climate risk insurance solutions. And as you can see here, 77% of these um, interviewed people said yes, we had difficulties um, in terms of re regulation when setting up these schemes. So this brings me to my next slide, because if regulation can be a hindrance, I think regulation can also be an enabler of climate risk insurance solutions. And this is what I would like to um, talk about right now. But let me start with just a quick recap. So besides consumer protection and ensuring the stability of the market, we see that many insurance supervisory authorities also have a mandate in market development. So these supervisors have within their means the ability to set up proper frameworks and uh, several uh, mechanisms to really enable the development of responsible markets. So what does that mean? What can they do um, more concretely to develop the market for climate risk insurance? Well, there are different, um, different approaches. Let me maybe start with the, um, with the uh, supply side and see how supervisors can stimulate the market for, um, or the supply for climate risk insurance. So as you can see here on this slide, the very first point here is by stimulating, um, uh, by enabling risk carriers within the domestic insurance market. What does that mean? Um, they can, for example, help the domestic insurance market to offer these products by setting up so-called co-insurance pools. The, the creation of such pools can really unlock opportunities for the development of climate risk insurance products, especially in those countries where one single insurer does not have the capacity or the skills to offer climate risk insurance. Many of these pools that we, um, that we currently see are founded on public-private partnership basis. So that means the government is involved and the, the uh, um, private sector is involved in the government in these cases often provide support through, for example, subsidies, reinsurance, or by taking on the risk directly. Here, the supervisor can play an instrumental role in driving these initiatives by providing advice and the setting up of the pool or setting clear regulatory perimeters to ensure that these pools can effectively operate um, and that they yeah, really make sure that they, that they are stable and sustainable. And to just um, name a few examples, in, in, in Senegal, it was actually the insurance super um, supervision department who really championed the creation of such a pool, the so-called CANAS. It's the National Agriculture Insurance Company of Senegal, and it's a specialized agriculture insurance company that really brings together the private and the public insurers to provide agricultural insurance products and specifically to uh, protect the rural populations against climate risk. We have other examples here. A very prominent one is, um, is from the Turkish government, who also decided to introduce a risk transfer scheme for earthquakes. 
um, but there were other examples and I just recently saw um, in the news that also Egypt's Insurance Federation announced that they would launch the first insurance pool in the country to mitigate natural disasters. So this can be one mechanism by setting up these pools. In addition, um, and more generally, what supervisors can do is to build resilience, uh, to build um, capacity of the local insurers. So they can, for example, provide relevant data if the insurers have no access to it. Then my second really important point here is um, this, the second bullet point here on the slide, that which means that supervisors can harness the role of the in industry by enabling innovation. Um, they, can, they are in the position to create an environment where insurers can test new ideas for climate risk solutions. And this is important to have the space to test these new, new ideas, to really learn from your mistakes, find solutions that work, um, and yeah, just make sure that they are sustainable in the future. So what the supervisor here can do proactively is, for example, to allow sandbox approaches. This is something we see in the insurtech space, an increasing number of supervisors are implementing these um, sandboxes. So this really gives the insurers or the practition, practitioners the space to inno innovate, but in a structured way where uh, consumer protection and so on is ensured. Also here we have very interesting examples. For example, um, the um, sandboxes or pilots in index-based insurance. So in countries like Guatemala or Kenya, where no index-based insurance regulation was in place, they decided to have these um, pilots or sandbox approaches. And then afterwards, based on the, the experiences and the learnings from these um, from these um, sandboxes, they then um, work on a regulation for index-based insurance. Another very crucial um, way of enhancing access to climate risk insurance is through uh, distribution channels. And this is something that we also observe in, um, in inclusive insurance, that it is crucial to have the right distribution channels to really reach people. And it's important to find organizations, entities they trust. And so, for example, cooperatives or agribusiness or community-based organizations, these people already have a good relationship with so that they can be used to also distribute insurance. And this brings me already to the demand side and how supervisors can stimulate demand. So um, there is, for example, um, the opportunity for supervisors to explore the possibility of making insurance against natural disasters mandatory in certain cases or by bundling products to gain scale. Because if we look right now at the most successful business models, these are those where the product is bundled or mandatory. So let's start with the bundling of products. This can uh, strengthen the demand and awareness for insurance. And it may be necessary in some cases in climate risk insurance, but actually not just in some cases, because what we see right now is that almost 90% of the index insurance products are bundled with low-end agricultural inputs or the provision of valuable information to the client. Of course, it is very important to make sure that um, also the product is uh, mandatory. The, the consumer is really, um, uh, sorry, also it is bundled. It is very um, important for the consumer to know that there is an insurance product attached to this non-financial product. And I already mentioned the mandatory cover. cover. This is the next, um, uh, the next um, possibility I wanted to highlight how to increase the demand. It is um, by making insurance against climate risk mandatory. Uh, it's sometimes difficult for voluntary insurance offered by the private sector to really um, gain scale. So there's quite often a low awareness and a lack of affordability in the countries. And uh, supervisors here can really explore the possibility of advocating for laws to make insurance mandatory. And this is something that we observe in several countries. Of course, also this comes with a couple of um, 
pros and cons, so to say, it's still very important, even when you have the mandatory schemes that the consumers are aware of the product, that they know about their benefits and also how to use it, and they should always be given the choice of selecting uh, providers, even the product is uh, mandatory. And also here we have a couple of um, examples like in Turkey where the earthquake insurance, for example, was made mandatory for um, residential buildings that fall within municipal municipality boundaries. Um, another uh, demand related um, Things supervisors can do is to explore the possibility of tax exemptions and here we see that it's um, sometimes really the supervisor who brings up the topic with the relevant government entities so we had the case in Nicaragua where it was the supervisor who consulted with the government um, representatives and now the, as a result in Nicaragua agricultural insurance is exempt from uh, VAT and we see that in other countries like Senegal and so where agricultural is um, um, agricultural insurance policies are, um, are uh, exempted from taxes. And of course subsidies is another topic. I don't want to go too much into detail because this is also a rather controversial uh, topic. topic. Um, it may be necessary to subsidize especially uh, in the in the early um, years of these programs but also here it's always um, important to, to have smart subsidies to really see if this is the only option. Um, and then the last point here on my slide is on um, how the supervisor can also support public awareness and educational efforts and I think this is maybe something um, Kofi can also um, refer to because I know that Ghana for example has a great program to or Great awareness program um, for insurance. Okay, so I know that has been quite a lot of information on one slide. So just to summarize that um, there is a way to enable demand and supply through regulation and supervision and it is very important to have the supervisor really involved in these um, uh, initiatives. But besides regulation, supervision, there is also um, there are other aspects where the supervisor can be really helpful in promoting climate risk insurance. And this brings me to the next slide, and we call it the championing uh, climate risk um, insurance, which means that um, supervisors really support the spread and adaptation of climate risk management, understanding and practices internally, but also among the critical stakeholders. So just to give you one example, we heard at, a, at an event last year in CIMA, the Inter-African Conference of Insurance Markets in West Africa. Um, here the regulator is currently drafting a climate strategy to really make sure that the supervisors are much more involved in climate related topics and to really raise awareness about um, the issue within the uh, authority. And it's still, we, we have to recognize that it is the uh, insurance supervisor who is the one who can really explain the particularities of insurance, of its benefits, what it does and what it does, what it does not. And they are, yeah, they are really the experts on the government level and that's why I would say it is so important to always include them in all these new initiatives that are now um, being, setting, being setting up. Um, we also see that in um, several countries, um, yeah, the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture, just to give you an example, sometimes have a wrong perception of insurance, so they are rather, rather hesitant to include insurance in their disaster resilience strategies because they believe that this would lead farmers to, to neglect their crops and to not adopt better practices because they know they will receive compensation anyway. But we have definitely enough studies and that show that this is not the case. And this is something the supervisor can bring up with the policymakers. And just generally, the insurance supervisor is in a really good um, position to ensure the alignment amongst all these stakeholders to really yeah, bring together the different uh, stakeholders and to also, um, like we've seen in Indonesia, for example, it was the supervisor who brought up the topic or the demand of fishermen for insurance. So it was the supervisor who said, okay, let's have a chat. We really have to make sure that these people get insurance and 
they brought together the public and the private sector to make this happen. But of course, what I just want to highlight here also is that this depends on how much the supervisor can be involved here, really depends on um, having the, the resources and also the mandate um, from the policymakers in their jurisdiction. Okay, so if you're interested in um, more examples of how supervisors can promote resilience, and this is the next slide, please, I would also like to um, make you aware of this publication, uh, which we, um, yeah, it was published um, late last year. And it has a lot of examples in it, and also just to mention that it is now available in Spanish and French too. So if you go to our website, or you can also just scan here the code on this, um, the QR code on this slide, then you will um, be able to download the presentation. And as I said before, next slide, please. Um, we did a couple of, um, we organized a couple of events. Uh, no, one. The, the one with the further reading, I think it's the one for this one, the slide with further reading is number 19, yeah, thank you. Um, we also organized a couple of uh, events, and if you're interested in uh, videos or reports or summaries of these events, you will also find them on our website, and I guess also the presentation will be shared with you afterwards, so you can just click on the link. Okay. And um, next slide, please. And now I'm finishing my presentation. And let me just conclude by just saying that it is really important to include the insurance supervisors from the very beginning in all these initiatives relating to um, climate risk um, insurance, but generally um, disaster management strategies. And um, now I've been talking quite a lot of, about supervisors and what they can do, and I think it's uh, time now to, to to have a chat with a real, so to say, supervisor to talk a bit about the topic and what they do. Um, and this is my actually next slide, and this is my last slide, just to thank you for your attention. And um, I guess we can, yeah, that one. Uh, we can directly start um, the discussion with Kofi and then answer your question. Is that fine with everyone? Yes. Yes, okay. So I'm really very pleased that Michael Kofi and the Deputy Commissioner of the National Insurance Commission of Ghana is here with us uh, today to share some examples that. So Kofi, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're very busy and these are very difficult times right now. So we really appreciate uh, you taking the time for this uh, chat. Can you hear me well, Kofi? Well, I can hear you very well, Teresa. And thank you for having me. Hi, Kofi. So good <laughs> to see you. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So maybe I can start directly with the with the first question for you. And I thought it would be yes. very interesting um, for me, for the audience, to hear a little bit about NIC's approach to promote resilience against climate risks and how you at the NIC, how you are trying to enable innovative uh, products and just generally what initiatives in Ghana, what, what, what initiatives are there in Ghana and how the NIC is involved. Thank you very much, Teresa. The NIC in Ghana um, has um, been making some effort to promote um, um, climate resilience. Um, some as far back as 2010, 2011, um, when we did some feasibility study on, on, on climate change or climate risk and, and its impact on, on the population. And this um, resulted in in a decision to actually set up an agricultural insurance pool, something you talked about earlier on, um, some, some initiatives that um, regulators can take. Yes, that happened here in Ghana as well. And so um, this was um, a project in, in, in collaboration with, with GIZ and other development partners. And so a decision was taken to set up uh, the Ghana agricultural insurance pool. Um, mainly at the beginning, um, this was supposed to provide um, insurance, um, weather 
uh, insurance protection for farmers in the northern part of the country where um, climate risk is, is more profound. Um, this poop uh, started with two main products, um, both um, index-based. You try to explain what index-based insurance products are um, at the beginning. So these are not... Uh, uh, um, sorry, um, Kofi. Kofi. Uh, sorry, sorry for yes. interrupting, but yes. I, I have a little bit, I have difficulties uh, hearing you. I'm not sure if it's only my connection or maybe someone else can just let us know if it's only me or if it's just a general problem. Um, Hannah or Laura, can you? Yes, I, I could uh, hear coffee perfectly well. So it might be at times that the connection is unstable for certain participants. Okay, so, so it's my think... internet connection yeah. then. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so, so. Maybe I will they... switch off my video. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So as I said, this pool started by providing weather index product and index product means they are not indemnity product, you, you try to explain. So we have the um, area yield index and we had a weather index. The weather index means that um, um, if the rainfall becomes too low or too high, then uh, farmers qualify for some kind of payout depending on how low or how high the, the, the rainfall was. And then the area yield index is where the yield for a particular crop in a particular area is, is measured over a period of time. And that results in a standard yield. And then when farmers apply all necessary prerequisites and they are not able to achieve that yield for that area, they receive um, a payout so the pool, the Ghana Agricultural Insurance Pool um, started with these two products, the weather index and the area yield index for, um, for the northern part of the country. It's been going, uh, it went well for some time, but um, the uptake um, were not as, as expected and um, probably I could, I could explain um, what actually um, has led to that and what we are doing about that now. So the first thing is affordability, something again that you talked about. Um, one thing that must come clear is that um, agricultural insurance, weather related insurance, because it is catastrophic in nature, is quite expensive. And so um, it, without the appropriate um, collaborations and help, um, the cost might just be too much. And it may either be not affordable for the consumers or not sustainable for the suppliers. And so that is um, one of the challenges that um, the pool has, has faced. Um, there is also not um, a comprehensive government policy that tackles entire value chains and therefore sort of makes these insurance products mandatory for small scale level farmers. So if you add that to the, to the background that these products are already expensive, then it becomes quite difficult for, for the upscale to, to happen mm -hmm. as, 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 as expected. But um, these are challenges that we are dealing with. And um, to address some of those things, the commission is currently working on something we call the Ghana Agricultural Insurance Policy. So this is going to be the national policy that we are going to um, present to government for, for acceptance and, and implementation, and basically to address the challenges that we have. And so we know there's a protection gap, and um, we know that there are demand barriers as well. So in the policy, we are recommending smart ways of, of removing the demand barriers to narrow the protection gap so that um, vulnerable farmers, smallholder farmers who face the risk of, um, uh, who face climate risk can actually build their resilience and, and probably pro uh, improve their inputs, their yield and, and their investment. Um, I don't know whether that is too long a question for your very short answer. For a too long an answer for your for your short short question. Sorry. 
<laughs> now that's really interesting. Thank you, Kofi. So, so you mentioned these demand um, um, barriers, and I know that Ghana is also very active. What I just mentioned in terms of like um, um, educating people or making people aware of um, the benefits of insurance. Is this something that you also do specifically for climate risk insurance? Yes, um, we actually have a very comprehensive um, insurance awareness um, strategy which we are rolling out. Again, this resulted from some pilots that we did in the past. And at the end of the day, the entire industry came together and decided to form one group to develop a comprehensive insurance awareness strategy, which has been developed and is being implemented in phases. So there are strategies for various segments of the population uh, uh, various age groups, various occupations, and of course there are um, segments for smallholder farmers, um, but the, the, the strategy is being implemented in phases, and of course the, the, there's a section, there's a whole phase for smallholder farmers which are being rolled out in the rural areas, in the countryside, in the non-urban areas where the majority of these people are uh, just to raise the awareness. It is not as if these people don't face risks. They do face risks, but uh, what can they do about it? How can insurance help them? How can they take advantage of, of what is available? These are things that the, the strategy or the education plan is trying to draw their attention to. And of course, with the, with the plan to get the government official policy involved, um, the puzzle, we expect the pieces of the puzzle to come together to actually create the picture that we want to see. Mm, okay, well, that's, that's really interesting. And in terms of you mentioned the like different stakeholders, and I always see this as something very challenging when it comes to climate risk insurance, that you have so many different stakeholders, so many ministries and different supervisors involved. So maybe can you share with us a little bit how is your experience or what is key like for this, for setting up the dialogue and to working jointly on, on, on this issue? Very interesting, very interesting because especially um, working on this proposed national agricultural insurance policy, we try to bring around the table as many of all the stakeholders as possible, um, chief among them the Ministry of Agriculture because that is where all the agricultural um, policy decisions are made and taken and so we brought them. Even within the ministry they do have divisions they have people in charge of crops, they have people in charge of monitoring and evaluation, they have people in charge of data and statistics, and getting all these, even these units to talk together and, and, and to seem to address the, the needs on the ground. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, the, the, there is the willingness, there is the, the goodwill to, to, to cooperate and to do this. And as you say, one role that I can see insurance supervisors um, um, play uh, in this is to actually take the initiative and bring these, these stakeholders together and to create the realization that in the long term, they have a super, super um, um, overarching objective and the bits and pieces can come together to help them to, to achieve. Of course, the agricultural people want to improve food security. And there is a role that insurance can play. There's a role that lending credit to, to, to small scholder farmers can play. And so when all this is brought together and made seamless, then it, it, it helps to, to achieve the overall objective. So yes, it's interesting. It's not easy getting them together around the table at once um, from the beginning. It is very difficult to get all the individual stakeholders to, to, to understand why they need to sit together with the insurance man to think through how um, their various objectives could be, could be achieved. But once this is done and once the picture becomes clearer, you would see that um, there is the willingness, there's the, there's the um, goodwill to work towards that. And so maybe the big lesson from there is that somebody needs to take the initiative of, of linking the relevant stakeholders and getting them around the table. And once the picture becomes clear to them, 
the the necessary goodwill mm -hmm. to collaborate and cooperate will be will be realized. Mm. Thank you, Kofi. Yeah, this is, yeah, I can imagine this is a very difficult situation, especially with, as you just said, these different objectives all the parties involved have and then bringing together such a comprehensive strategy. So, but I, I, I agree with you, what you just said, it's really um, also something that we see in, in, in several countries that it is the supervisor who is really the driving force and really the one who is trying to align and the, the, the interest, the, the, the mandate and objective. So, it's good to see that this is uh, happening in Ghana too. And I don't know in terms of time, because I know we only have like 10 minutes or so left, maybe just a question to the moderator. Um, if we should open the floor for questions from the audience, and I guess there are also questions for Kofi now. Um. Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Kofi and Teresa for with the presentations and, and also sharing what has been done in Ghana and your reflections and questions uh, around, um, around uh, climate risk insurance, the rollout and the coordination. We already have now two questions in the Q&A box. Um, and for anybody else attending the webinar, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. You can type in English, in Spanish or in French. Um, Unfortunately, the chat is not currently work working, so anything uh, would need to go into the Q&A uh, box in the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Uh, one question first from, uh, from Saul from uh, the Central uh, Bank of El Salvador, um, asking which level of climate risk insurance is considered more efficient? Um, mm. And we have a second question, but I would need one of my colleagues to translate it from Spanish to English first. So maybe if you want to reflect on the different levels of climate risk insurance and what is considered more efficient. Yes, I guess this refers to the different levels that the micro, meso and macro level I presented. And um, thanks for that question. I, mm, I actually couldn't say really if they're one of these strategies is more efficient than than the other because they are they have different objectives really so on the macro level the aim is to um, to to help governments to to um, really cope with heavy disasters with hurricanes and so on so on the micro level, it is the um, the, the smallholder farmer who is directly protected. So I would rather not say that one is more efficient than the other. I think they are all important and they are part of a bigger like uh, strategy. So having these sovereign schemes in in, in place is still it, it it is still necessary to have the protection on the micro level. So I would say, and there is this example of CRIF, the Caribbean um, insurance. And that uh, I'm always using only the abbreviation of CRIF. So the the, the sovereign uh, scheme in the Caribbean. Um, countries, which is on the sovereign level, but at the same time, they just recently announced that they also developed a product on the micro level to directly protect the fishermen. So here it is, um, if I'm not mistaken, it is the government who is the policy holder, but the direct beneficiary of the insurance is the um, um, it is the, the, the fisherman. So as you can see in this example, I think it is important to have all the, um, on all the levels working together so there's not one more important than the other. I don't know, maybe Kofi, there's something you would like to add. Yes, to exactly. I, I, I agree with what Teresa has just said. Um, I know jurisdictions where these are being combined to create a more um, um, resilient uh, um, protection for for both the economy and for for the individual. So, in in one jurisdiction that I know, there's the macro protection, the sovereign risk, and then there's the micro for 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 the individual um, 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 small scale um, farmers. And when there's a catastrophe, um, the government. Um, 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 mac macro or the sovereign payout will, will go only to those who have the micro policies, who have taken the micro policies to protect mm -hmm. themselves. So if you only have that, so that is a kind of incentive to, to the individual farmers 
to protect themselves. That look, if you go one step to protect yourself, the government will add two steps so that when there's a risk that goes beyond you, you can get your payout from the insurance company and the government sovereign policy can also add something up to you. So I know countries where these, is, these different levels are beautifully combined to create a, a more sustainable um, protection. So they don't compete. Uh, in fact, they can be made to complement each other very beautifully. Yeah, very good. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we have two additional questions. The first one I'll give over to my colleague Laura, who will translate it from Spanish to English for you. Yes, the question is, what is the best alternative if, if the state is the one that grants agricultural lending? So the first option is uh, that the state itself contracts or hire the insurance and assume the cost of the, pre the, cost of the premium or the other option is that the debtor contracts directly the insurance uh, to raise awareness into the debtor and encourage risk mitigation. Okay, so it was the question for me. I'm not sure if I got it. Yeah, so is so, it about whether it should be the government uh, paying for the insurance or the um, or directly the um, like smallholder farmer or the Yes, exactly. So the question is, in case that the state is the one that has to provide this uh, agricultural lending, what is the best option? That the state itself uh, pays the price for the premium or left that the debtor pays for the premium. And, and with this action, they will increase their awareness to, uh, and to encourage the risk mitigation. Okay. Um, can, can I say something? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, and the the government here is developing a scheme to to improve lending to the small scale farmers to the agricultural sector, and it is designed in such a way um, as to encourage banks and other lending institutions to improve um, lending to, to the agricultural sector and especially the small scale farmers. So there is a guarantee fund that sort of guarantees the, the loans that are given to the, the farmers under the scheme. But as part of the loan that is given to the farmers, part is used to pay the insurance premium. So the, the, it is not all the risks that insurance will cover the risks that will cause the farmer to default in paying the loan, some of them can be insured, some of them cannot be insured. Those that can be insured are covered by insurance, but part of the loan that the farmer is taking is used to pay that premium. So if something happens and that, that peril is covered, then the insurance um, pool pays out to, to, to the farmer. And then if something happens which is not covered by the insurance bill, then of course the, the guarantee fund comes out to, to, to pay. I don't know whether um, that, that sort of um, um, offers any explanation or any clue to, to the question that you, you put out. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we have one uh, additional question. Um, the last one we'll, we'll take in this webinar. Uh, it's coming from Bangladesh Bank, uh, Bank uh, Iqbal Hossein. Uh, if I can maybe give you the floor to ask the question directly to the panelists, if, if that's agreeable. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. My question is, uh, as the insurance premium will increase the cost of the of the borrower or 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 the government who is willing to uh, willing to pay the premium so my question is if one dollar increase uh, increase in insurance premium how much will the bank reduce the price to the borrower because the uh, risk premium will be decreased and maybe some cent central bank will also reduce their provision requirement for because there is already one insurance so how much is the decrease for one dollar increase in insurance premium what is the empirical evidence do you have any empirical evidence that for one dollar increase in insurance premium like 20 or 30 cents will be decreased in other prices other components of interest rate uh, setting mechanisms thank you very much 
Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I am not a, a banker, and so um, for the empirical figures that you say, I might not be able to, to, to put them out right now. Maybe when I finish, um, um, some others who are more um, into the banking sector could um, respond. But the thing is that in the scheme that the government is setting up here in Ghana, the idea is to de-risk lending to, 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 the, to the agricultural sector. And so there's a guarantee fund. So that itself um, is supposed to lead to lower lending rates to the small scale farmers. Now, the premium that is supposed to be paid, there is a debate. The scheme is still um, under, still being planned, still in a pilot phase, but there's a debate. Should the premium be, be subsidized uh, or completely, or should it all be borne by, by the farmer? That's one debate that um, hasn't um, entirely been, been settled. But of course, knowing that the, the, the lending has been de-risked by this guarantee fund, it results in some significant drop in the, 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 the um, interest rate. And of course, the provisioning arrangement around these, because this is a special scheme to, to stimulate lending to the agricultural sector, the provisioning and other um, um, regulatory arrangement around it are not, are not just as the same as you would find on, on the commercial side as well. Um, I don't know whether this help and my other colleagues can also come from their point of view. Yes, thank you. Uh, Teresa, do you have anything to add on that? I'm afraid this is a very, very technical question. So I think uh, Kofi answered it uh, very well. So no okay. additional comments from my side. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no additional questions uh, in the question and answer box. Um, if this, so I think we're, we will uh, conclude the webinar. If I could ask both Teresa and Kofi maybe with some, some final reflections from your side in, in uh, you know, how to move forward globally with rolling out um, more uh, climate risk insurance, also reaching those that are the most vulnerable. Uh, and maybe also from your side reflections on um, what the role of other financial regulators beyond those that regulate directly uh, the insurance sector, what that is in rolling out climate risk insurance. You've been touching on it a little bit in terms of coordination, but also here in, in the IGF working group, quite a number of, of regulators do not directly regulate the insurance industry, but clearly have a, a keen interest still in climate risk insurance. So thank you. Yeah, maybe if I can just start on what you just said, um, I think uh, really um, summarizes um, very well with the deal. So my key takeaway from the research we've been doing on the topic that this must be a joint effort. And as Kofi mentioned, I know it's, uh, or I understand it's difficult sometimes to bring all the relevant stakeholders with their different um, objectives on the table. but. The, the one slide I also showed with, the, showed with these um, integrated disaster risk management strategies shows that we really need to put our efforts together because there are different instruments that we need to help uh, people becoming more resilient. And only if we manage to make this a joint effort, I think we will be really successful. And this includes the the, the different supervisors, the insurance, the banking supervisors that have to um, think about uh, their strategies, but also on the uh, ministry level, I think um, this is really the important uh, takeaway for me that um, so all these parties are very relevant and this is, must be a joint effort really, yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Okay. And Hello? I think Kofi. Yes. Okay. So um, yes, climate um, risk is 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 a real risk. It's, it's becoming more and more relevant, and it affects um, 
people, especially in the emerging economies, low-income people. I think um, in one of um, Teresa's slides, she did mention that it hits the low-income people harder than, than the, the high-income people. And so as regulators in the financial services sector, um, some effort should be made to, to, to protect these people. The point is that at this point in time, especially those of us in emerging uh, market, we need to develop the market as, as an insurance regulator. Uh, we need to develop the insurance market to make sure that the people have the kind of insurance protection that will help them to, to, to reduce poverty and to build wealth and to manage their risks. But these efforts must be relevant. They must talk to, to the current issues, the current risks that affect them. And so somebody needs to take the initiative. Somebody has to start it. Somebody has to initiate something and call others to join. And I agree with Teresa that um, regulators can take that initiative. They may not have what it takes to go all alone. In fact, they will need all the other people around the table. But they can um, take the initiative to stimulate the, the, the desire to, to build systems to ensure a more uh, effective resilience for 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 our smallholder farmers and 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 uh, 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 low-income people against climate risks, and so I'll, um, uh, I think this is very relevant, and we must all see as if I don't know whether everybody on on the panel is a regulator. Um, if we are, then there, there's something. Uh, Teresa has outlined so many things that we can do as regulators to actually um, improve. The resilience against climate risk and we should take action on, on them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe uh, I can just add uh, one please. sentence. Sorry, Johanna, just one sentence because we are always talking about the different stakeholders, the ministries, the supervisors, but something we should always um, yeah, just not forget about is the to also talk to the to the actual clients of um, so the, the beneficiaries of these um, solutions that we are developing, because sometimes we, um, we forget to really identify what are the most pressing uh, risks for them. And we are setting up schemes without really consulting them. So this is also just um, one of the, um, yeah, like takeaways uh, <laughs> from, from the work on the topic that we should always um, make sure that also the actual client is included in our discussion. Thank you. Yes, uh, a big thank you to, to both of you for your insights, experience, and, and also sharing now at the end some of your reflections on the way forward and, and how to coordinate this and, and also how to design it in the most efficient way. I think it's clear that there's some really great initiatives ongoing. The work by A2II is, is very impressive, and I know a, a number of, of our members also uh, are working uh, with you on, on developing uh, inclusive insurance schemes and also it's been very interesting to hear uh, from from Kofi and from Ghana what has been done there. So a big thank you for taking part uh, in this webinar with us. For um, all the attendees, uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded and we will be sharing it with you uh, as well as the slides uh, from this presentation as well. Uh, so to all of you, a big silent uh, round of applause, a big thank you um, to our um, translators as well, uh, great job. Um, and to everybody in the IGF working group, we will reconvene at the same time next week for our fourth and last uh, IGF technical uh, webinar uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.